So let's start. Uh, today's lecture is on cryptographic hash functions. So before we uh, delve into the details of uh, cryptographic hash functions, uh, let's talk about some, some basics. So we know that encryption protects against uh, passive attacks, right? Eavesdropping, those kind of attacks. So a different requirement is to protect against active attacks, like protection attacks uh, against attacks uh, that try to falsify data or transaction transactions, such as like uh, uh, against messages or data authentication. So a message, file, or document, or like other collection of data is said to be authentic when it is genuine and came from the alleged source. The message or data authentication is a procedure uh, that allows communicating parties to verify that received or stored messages are in fact authentic. So two important aspects are to verify that the contents of the message have not been altered and that the source is authentic. We may also wish to verify a message's timeliness, for instance, that it has not been artificially delayed or replayed, right? Stored and then sent, which is called replay. And uh, also like the sequence of the message relative to uh, other messages that are flowing between the two parties. So all of these concerns um, come under the category of data integrity. Now it would seem possible to perform authentication simply by the use of symmetric encryption that we've seen so far. Now if we assume that only the sender and the receiver share a key, which is like as it should be in symmetric encryption, then only the genuine sender would be able to encrypt a message successfully for the other participant, provided the receiver can recognize a valid message. Now furthermore, if the message includes an error detection code and a sequence number, then the rece receiver is assured that no alterations have been made and that sequencing is proper. Now, if the time message also includes, let's say a timestamp, right? So if the message also includes a timestamp, so the receiver is assured that the message has not been delayed beyond the expected time for whatever the network transit or whatever the uh, message uh, retrieval time is. However, symmetric encryption alone is not suitable for data authentication, right? So let's give like one simple example. So in the ECB mode of encryption that we've seen in the last class, if an attacker re uh, reorders, let's say the blocks of those ciphertexts, then each block will still decrypt successfully, right? However, the reordering may alter the meaning of the overall data sequence. So although the sequence numbers may be used at some level, it is typically not the case at a sep uh, that a separate sequence number will be associated with each uh, bit block of plain text. So thus this block reordering is definitely a, a viable threat. So one authentication technique uh, involves the use of a secret key to generate a small block of data known as a message authentication code that is appended to the message. And if you see the figure, so the message runs through the message authentication algorithm and this uh, message authentication code is added on to the original message, okay? So this technique basically assumes that the two communicating parties, let's say A and B, share a common secret key that we saw in the last class. So when A has a message to send to B, it calculates the message authenticate, authentication code as a complex function of the message and the key. 
and then the message plus the code are transmitted to the in intended recipient. The recipient performs the same calculation on the received message using the same secret key to generate a new message authentication code. The received code is compared to the uh, calculated code that was sent. And uh, if we assume uh, that only the receiver and the sender know the identity of the secret key, and if the received code matches the calculated code, then one, the receiver is assured that the message has not been altered, right? So if an attacker, let's say, alters the message but does not alter the code, then the receiver's calculation of the code will definitely differ from the received code. So because the attacker is assumed not to know the secret key, the attacker cannot alter the code to correspond to the alterations in the message. Then number two, the receiver is also assured that the message is for, uh, from the alleged sender. Why? Because no one else knows the secret key. So no one else could prepare a message with a proper code. Right? Then number three, so if the message includes a sequence number, uh, then the receiver can be assured of the proper sequence because an attacker cannot successfully alter the sequence number. Right? So there are a number of algorithms that can be used to generate these kinds of uh, codes or MACs, like message authentication codes. Uh, the NIST, again the standards body, recommends the use of DES. DES is used to generate an encrypted version of the message and the last number of bits of the ciphertext are used as the code. Usually a 16 or 32 bit code is typical. So the process um, just described basically is similar to encryption. One difference is that the authentication algorithm need not be reversible as it must be for decryption. But it turns out that because of the mathematical properties of the authentication function, it is less vulnerable to being broken by uh, than a, a normal encryption algorithm. Okay. Then, like I said earlier, one of the things cryptography offers to its user is the capability to verify the integ integrity and the authentication. So integrity basically assures a recipient that the information remain unchanged and it is in its true original form while authentication provides the capability to ensure that messages are sent from who you believed sent them and that messages are received by the intended recipient. So hashing algorithms, uh, basically the, the topic of today's class, function by taking a variable amount of data and then compressing it into a fixed length value which is referred to as a hash value or in other words, it's called, also called a message digest. So hashing basically provides a fingerprint or message digest of the data. Okay. Uh, strong hashing algorithms are hard to break and will not produce the same hash value for two or more messages. Okay. So each time uh, it will produce a new hashing value, the strong ones that is. So hashing can be used to meet the goals of integrity and or non-repudiation, which means that you cannot deny that you sent the data or you are not the actual recipient, depending on how the algorithms are used. So hashes can also help verify the information has remained unchanged. Okay, so the figure basically gives you an overview of this hashing process. Now hashing algorithms are not intended to be reversed or reproduce the data. So the purpose of the message digest is to verify the integrity of the message. Okay. So in a well-designed message digest, if there is even a slightest change in the input string, the output hash value would change drastically. So this is known as the avalanche effect. Okay. So, and uh, uh, 
example is like on this slide that you, you can just send in the messages through a hash function basically or a hash algorithm that produces this one way hash slight change if even if you change a single character in this document the hash value should be totally changed okay again so this is just saying the same thing that a hash function which is h maps a plain text here p to generate a value x which is this thing so this is plain text this is the hash function h you get x okay so that's what this thing is and that thing is called the hash value or digest of p this is the digest of this document okay so a collision is a pair of plain text that map to the same hash value okay so two functions may produce or end up in the same hash uh, digest or same hash value the collisions are unavoidable uh, this h uh, the function can be applied to a block of data of any size depending on the type of algorithm um, and it produces a fixed length output and uh, the hash is relatively easy to compute for any given x or any given uh, sorry uh, uh, plain text making both hardware and software implementations practical that's why people like or like companies like hash functions uh, generally like for efficiency computation of the hash function should take time which is proportional to the length of the input of the plain text then there is a data structure called a hash table um, which is like a search data structure um, where you can store items according to their hash values so it's like a key value pair and the keys are those hash digests and the values will be uh, uh, Oh, sorry the the values are there uh, hash digests and when you have collisions like two uh, entries go to the same basket or same location then you can use chaining which is like you build a chain at that point so you start put an item at one place and then the other goes in a chain uh, at the same location or you can have open addressing where you uh, if there is a, an item already there you can map through the table and wherever you find an open place the next open place you can put uh, the hash value there okay um, what else yeah so hash function basically like it's an alternative to the message, uh, message authentication code uh, but as with message, message authentication code, a hash function accepts uh, a variable size message, right? Um, as input, produces a fixed uh, length output that we already said. Uh, typically, uh, the message is padded out to an integer multiple of some, uh, same, uh, sorry, some fixed length. And you already know what padding is. We've seen it in the previous class. That if your uh, block is let's say 124 bits. Uh, sorry 1024 bits. And your message is only 1022. Then the rest of the two bits will be padded on to make it a complete block. Right. Um, so the length field is usually like a security measure to increase the difficulty. Uh, for an attacker to produce an alternative message with the same hash value okay and this is like the the first figure that we saw it's it's showing you the same thing that the message goes through the hash function you get a code uh, and which is padded to the message and then the message can be sent okay uh, however, unlike MASH, uh, sorry, MAC, uh, a hash function does not take a secret key as input. Okay, so the figure basically illustrates the way in which messages can be authenticated using this hash function. 
the message digest can be encrypted using encryption which is happening here right if it is assumed that only the sender and receiver share the encryption key defined by k in this figure so that way authentication is also assured so again the purpose of the hash function is to produce a fingerprint of a file a digest of the file a message or a block of data right but to be useful for a message authentication a hash function must have these properties number one it can be applied to a block of data of any size two it produces a fixed length output okay uh, age of x is relatively easy to compute for any given x making both hardware and software implementations practical then for any authentication code let's say h it is computationally infeasible to find uh, x such that the hash of x is the uh, hash digest or the when you pass x through the hash function you get the same digest so hash function with this property is usually called um, a one way hash or a pre image resist resistant hash then number 5 uh, for any given block x okay it is computationally infeasible to find a y uh, that is not equal to x such that the hash functions of x and y are the same okay hash function with this property is called uh, second pre image resistant and it is sometimes also referred to as weak collision resistant again collision resistant mean uh, that for any two different messages the same hash function will not produce the same output okay it's computationally infeasible to find given that the two hashes are the same to find what the um uh, sorry the original messages were uh, equal so we we do not want that then number 6 it is computationally infeasible to find any pair of x and y again two messages or blocks such that their hashes are same and this is called collision resistant and this is called strong collision resistant so these first three properties are requirements for practical application of a hash function which is to message authentication the fourth property is a one way property so it is easy to generate a code given a message but virtually impossible to generate a message given a code and here by code we mean that message digest or hash digest so this property is important if the authentication technique involves the use of a uh, secret value now the secret value itself is not sent however if the hash function is not one way uh, an attacker can easily discover the secret value so if the attacker can observe and intercept a transmission let's say the attacker obtains let's say a message m and its hash code uh the attacker can then invert the hash function to obtain um uh, uh, the original message okay because the attacker now has both uh, m like which is the original message and the uh, uh salt value and we'll see what the salt value is uh then the fifth property guarantees that it is impossible to find an alternative message uh with the same hash value as a given message so this prevents a forgery when an encrypted hash value is used or hash code is used so if this property were not true an attacker uh, would be uh, capable of uh, let's say a given sequence first 
let's say, observe or intercept a message, uh, plus its encrypted hash code, then at step two, it, he will, or it will generate an encrypted hash code from the message, and third, generate an alternate message with the same hash code. Okay. So a hash function that satisfies the first five properties, uh, like I said, is referred to as a weak hash function. A strong hash function protects against an attack in which uh, one party generates a message for an other party to sign, uh, which is this fifth, uh, sixth property. For example, let's say uh, uh, Bob gets to write an IOU kind of message and he sends it to Alice and then she signs it. So Bob finds two messages with the same hash, one of which requires Alice to pay a small amount and one that requires a large payment. Alice signs the first message and Bob is then able to claim that the second message is authentic. Right? So what uh, can Alice do then? If uh, again we are talking about if they both go to an arbitration or like go through an arbitration then uh, Bob can say that she agreed to the larger message. Right? Uh, a larger, uh, not message, the, the largest payment. There is. So this slide is basically saying the same thing as a cryptographic hash function uh, adds those uh, like fourth, fifth and sixth property, right? Uh, meaning that it's com uh, computationally infeasible to find uh, those pairs of values, right? Uh, then like in cryptography, there is something called a random oracle, okay? A random oracle is uh, an oracle. Oracle is, you can think of it as like a theoretical black box that responds to every query or every unique query with a truly random response chosen uniformly out of its output domain. So if a query is repeated, it responds the same way every time that the query is submitted. Okay. Um, stated in another way, a random oracle is a mathematical function chosen uniformly at random. Uh, that is a function that's mapping each possible query to a fixed random response from its output domain okay and we'll see like how it's used then as with symmetric encryption there are two approaches uh, to attacking a secure hash function one is uh, through cryptanalysis the other is through brute force uh, and similar to symmetric encryption, cryptanalysis of hash functions also involves um, exploiting logical weaknesses in the algorithm. And the strength of a hash function against brute force attacks depends on or solely on the length of the hash code that's produced by the algorithm. So for a hash code of length n, the level of effort that's required is proportional to uh, the pre-image resistance, uh, second pre-image resistance and collision resistance, like said earlier, right? Uh, so in recent years, uh, the most widely used hash function has been this SHA, which is the secure hash algorithm, was developed by NIST back in 93. Uh, when the uh, weaknesses were discovered in SHA, a revised version was issued in 95 and uh, then in 2002. Uh, then NIST also produced like a revised version of uh, which is like now starting from, I, I don't know uh, what were the number of bits. Uh, I think it started with the 160 bits. Now it's SHA is uh, running at 512 bits and I think it's called SHA 512, right? 
So these new versions have the same underlying structure and uses the same uh, types of modular arithmetic and binary operations as the original algorithm. And uh, what those are, how they work, again, it's too high level for this type of class, this introductory class. Uh, uh, but again, like we have discussed these hash functions for message authentication and for the creation of digital signatures. Um, the two examples are passwords and intrusion detection. For passwords, uh, like a hash of a password can be stored by an operating system uh, rather than the password itself. Like instead of storing the password, you store like a digest or a hash of the password. Thus the actual password is not retrievable by a hacker who gains access to the password file, let's say. So in, in simple term, uh, terms, when a user enters a password, the hash of that password is compared to the uh, stored hash value for verification. And even if that hash value is uh, compromised, uh, the attacker cannot have access to this account, right? Similarly, intrusion detection, uh, so you store the hash for each file on a system and secure the hash values. Okay, for example, on a CDR that is kept secure. Then one can later determine if a file has been modified by computing the hash of the uh, new file. So intruder would need to change the uh, file without changing the hash function of the file, right? So these are like some of the, uh, you can say, applications. Then the type of attack. So there's a attack, again, um, common, or you can say, uh, not common, uh, oof, what's the word? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, you can say it common, like, like an attack that, uh, usually happens when you use brute force type of uh, uh, algorithms with uh, hash functions. So birthday attack basically focuses on finding collisions. So its name basically comes from statistical phenomena known as the birthday paradox. So the birthday paradox basically states that if there are 23 people in a room, there is a 50% chance that any two of them will have the same birthday. This is not the same year, but instead the same month and day. Okay, for instance, March 30th or something like that. Now with February 29 in a leap year, there are what? 366 possible days in one year. If there are 367 people in a room, you have then a 100% chance of getting at least two people with the same birthdays, right? Now, if you keep on reducing this to 23 people in a room, you will still have a 50% chance that any two have the same birthday, right? I hope you guys get this, that if there are 367 people in a room with 366 days in a year, it is 100% chance, right? Now you keep on reducing the number of people from 367 down to 23 and your probability or chance of two people getting the same birthday is 50%. Okay. Now this is similar to finding any two passwords with the same hash. Right. So if a hashing function could only let's say create 366 different hashes like similar to the days of the year then an attacker with a sample of only 23 hashes has what? A 50% chance of discovering those two passwords that create the same hash. Okay, Hashing algorithms obviously can create many more than 366 different hashes, but the point is that the birthday attack method does not need all possible hashes to see a match. Okay, so you guys see the connection? So from another perspective, 
imagine th- that you are one of those uh, you know, two people in the room right or one of those 23 people in the room and you want want to find someone else with the same birthday as yourself now in this example you will need what 253 more people in the room to reach the same 50% probability of finding someone else with the same birthday. Now, even though you need more people in the room, the point is that you don't need an exact 366 people in the room to find a match. Okay. Now, the maths of this thing, again, is listed on the slide. If you don't understand, it's okay. Uh, we're not going into the details. Uh, But if you want to read more about this on the book, you're more than welcome. But again, if you don't understand this, I don't require you in this introductory class. Then it's possible for some uh, like tools to come up with another password that creates the same hash value of a given hash. For example, if you know that the hash of, let's say an administrator password account is uh, some random characters, 1A5C, let's say, right? So some tools can identify a password that will create the same hash of uh, 1A5C. Now it isn't necessarily the same password, but if it can create the same hash, it is just as effective as the original passwords sometimes and in some systems. Then there's... uh, uh, like algorithms, MD5. So in 1991, Rivest basically uh, released uh, a version of his uh, message digest algorithm, which he called MD5. So it processes 512 bits of blocks of the message, but it uses four distinct rounds of computation to produce a digest of the same length as the original algorithms and MD5 has uh, padding requirements as we've seen earlier in like blocks. MD5 implements an additional security feature that reduces the speed of the message, uh, speed of the message digest that is, uh, digest production. Uh, However, like recent cryptanalytic attacks demonstrated that this protocol is subject to collisions, preventing its use for ensuring message authentic uh, integrity sorry okay then like i said earlier sha is the other algorithm uh, for hashing perhaps one of the widest used hash algorithms today and uh, like the details you can read uh, how it works Again, we're not concerned just for you to know that there is an algorithm SHA and the family starts from, I think, uh, SHA0. Now it's at SHA5, right? Uh, or SHA512, in fact. Yeah. Oh, SHA3, uh, which is 1024 bits, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that basically concludes like the brief introduction of what hashing is, how and what exact mathematics is involved. Again, we are not concerned. We'll play a little bit in the lab uh, regarding hash values and stuff. Uh, but again, read the book regarding this uh, topic also. So that's all for this uh, class.